It has full SIM card capability. It has GPS. It has Wi-Fi. It has Bluetooth. It actually is a has cameras, full touch screen, reasonably high resolution. Um, it's incredible what can actually be had and built at price points, and that's changing a lot of the dynamics. We'll talk a little bit about that. The other thing I want to share with you is prior to sort of uh, going back to running my own company, I've worked at Microsoft for 10 years. And while there, I was primarily a language architect. I own many languages. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and I also, among which may or may not be interesting to people, I was focused for my last few years there um, specifically on cloud and DevOps and so on. And I was the architect for PowerShell. All right, I'm going to jump back, Oops, wrong direction. I want to spend a little bit of time to, to focus you on what this slide is about because it really is the centerpiece of most of what this talk is. Now, I know nobody can read this, so it's okay. But what it really is is a diagram of what the COF file format is. Now, does anybody know what COF is? Or the PE file format or ELF formats? Okay, so they're really all the same the thing. Name, not the same. <coughs> right, right. So, so the, the physical file format is actually universal. And it dates back a very long time, depending on how long you've been developing in the industry. Um, and it's quite standardized. It turns out many people don't really know very much about how its internals work. But there's a lot of tricks that if you do, and we're going to talk about how heavily and important it is to be able to exploit them, you can take advantage of. The most important one that everybody probably is familiar with is BusyBox. Everybody, how many people know what BusyBox is? So I'm going to give a little bit of an explanation for what BusyBox is about. BusyBox stems from a similar idea to what Donald Knuth did in the late 70s, early 80s in his implementations of trying to build tech. The idea was you want to have a single binary that can do a lot of different things. And the way in which BusyBox did their, does their implementation, it's used in a lot of embedded Linuxes, is they basically build a single binary. It's almost like a Swiss Army knife. And all you have to do is change what its name is, and it will behave differently. So depending on what its name is, when it starts up, it looks at its name and says, oh, this is my name right now, and therefore I'm going to behave as this app. It's a very powerful idea. So I will also take you in, in, in this tour a very brief retrospective, um, a, little, a little flashback to 1997. But the important thing to know for me, um, and, and what we're going to talk about here, is that everything I build and has been for many generations. It's actually the 25th anniversary edition of this Engine 4, um, and it's evolved since then. We'll talk about that. But it's a single binary, and it's actually built to be a DLL so it can live inside of any other thing, and it's very morphable. Um, it has no installation. You drop it in, and that's it. It also, um, which is config free. Now, another thing you'll find, and I'll talk about a little bit, I happen to focus because a lot of my work last year was at Microsoft, but it is on, was on DevOps. So developer operations, being able to run cloud data centers. And I was firmly convinced, and my friends down at Microsoft think I was totally spot on, that the large public cloud is moving towards what we call edge compute cloud or the small Soho cloud. And if you saw the internal Microsoft discussions on all this, you'd see that they're seriously realizing how big a problem that is and, what, and trying to penetrate that space. Um, one can think of that a lot like the way mainframes started off as being dominant and then PCs stepped in. There's a similar kind of phenomenon the way the cloud's evolving. And a lot of the technology that I've been building is aimed towards that reality. So the first part is we talked a, a year ago and you basically saw the language running and, and various pieces of it. It's been a year, a lot more has gone on. And we're going we're gonna to talk about some of that. But I want to give you a, f a little bit of foundation of what's actually working, what we're going to see demoed throughout the course of this conference. So first of all, it has a rich web server engine. It rivals Nginx performance. Um, it has full SSL, cert management, all kinds of stuff in it. Um, I want to give a special commentary to sort of thank Richard for all of his contributions to what I think have been significant to all, of, all software and computer science today with the work he's done on on SQLite, as well as Engine, as well, sorry, as, as Fossil, and we'll talk a lot about why I think Fossil is important, especially because I had recent discussions with people trying to work with sub repos and other stuff in Git, and what a nightmare it was for them. Um, second, I really want to talk about DevOps toolset. 
Um, you'll see once I show you another slide that I've got a pretty long language history, and it's taught me a lot of things about trying to fit the spectrum of, of making a language um, really multi-purpose. And it's a little bit of an explanation as well of why I chose to work with Tickle from the beginning. Uh, second is a whole notion on virtual file systems. And this really speaks as, a little bit as well to, to the work that um, Richard pioneered with in, in things I think he did with Fossil. Um, but you'll see that we've got a full virtual file system uh, with actual security um, and being able to span all aspects of the operating system, codecs and so on. And, and some of the things that are really important like time management and time analysis libraries. And then finally, one of my talks that I'm going to do later is on SQLite and integration into SQLite, merging TSL straight into SQLite, being able to store procedures and a rich bunch of other things. I use that extensively in our systems along with JSON integration. All right, so I just wanted, we'll come back to that, but I wanted to give that as a foundation because that's going to dominate almost all the rest of the talks I give um, through the thing. But I'm going to jump over this. This is just telling you it's year two. All right, so for those that didn't meet me last year, <laughs> I'm David Simmons, and I just sort of going to say that a year's gone by, and we're going to basically go through a little refresher, and then I'm going to try to take you right into a series of demos and somewhat open discussions. Um, so first thing I want to tell you a little bit about the system and, and what it's been used. So whenever I build something, I don't like to build it in, in absentia of it being actually used in a practical application. So this, this system has all been built to drive and run all the light phone cloud services. And a single, a single engine in that can support about 10,000 customers on a live telephony switchboard. And to understand what that means is one process can host many engines, and each engine runs with some set of thread affinity in it. So it's highly scalable. It's deployed as a single binary, as I mentioned before, in a single file. If you've looked at Node.js, and I did lots of work with Node.js, and, and that because I was Microsoft's JavaScript architect, I can tell you it's a mess. And people trying to deploy today, they deploy 2,000 files. Can you imagine what happens when you deploy on, a, on an IoT device that doesn't have high performance I.O. onto its memory card? What happens? It's a mess. And the idea that you would give updates on that's even harder. <clears throat> Second, um, one thing that, how many people here know what a sim link is? Well, OK, fantastic, awesome. If you come from the Microsoft space, it's not always clear that they know what that's about. Um, it's been evolving. Actually, I've been very, very impressed since I left Microsoft how well they've done in evolving some of their stuff. Um, but one of the things that's really important in any of these environments, and I will share some things that were horrific at Microsoft um, about eight to ten years ago. When they compared the Linux setups, especially when I first got in and was looking at some of the cloud stuff, they talked about it taking one to two days to deploy server setups. They were competing against um, either Amazon AWS stuff going up in, say, 10 minutes or so, or what Google was doing in maybe a half hour to, to deploy it and bring up systems. Um, albeit a lot of work, a lot of script management, but it was a, it's one of the biggest challenges in any um, cloud infrastructure setup. And it only gets worse as you start looking at IoT systems, especially with all the network chatter and other problems. So it becomes super important that you be able to set up systems and do so with pretty much zero configuration. Now our system set up in a matter of a few minutes at most. They're automatically entirely self-deploying and they, they deploy <coughs> everything through repositories. Um, and we have a pretty full set of DevOps uh, operations that are integrated in to do that. So I'm gonna now have a little bit of humor with you for a moment. Um, what do you think the acronym ST stands for? Now, jumping in, it stands for site. It also could be small talk and small script, and has been. But I'm a big proponent of names. Names are very important, especially if you come from a small talk background um, or language design background in this space. So if my slides are cooperating, what do you think the meaning of the acronym AOS is, which is the original engine name? It stands for Agents Object System, Agile Object System, and Actor. It's actually a registered mark, et cetera. It stems from a lot of things that were evolving and weren't necessarily at all my ideas in the mid to late 80s. If anybody knows what actors are or remembers all the early work that, Mike, that, that um, sorry, Apple was doing on agents of that kind of technology. Um, but I pioneered or the very first engine that was fully preemptively multi-threaded, ran on the Mac, ran elsewhere, um, running small talks, and had fully integrated object-oriented database technology. Um, 
There we go. What do you think the acronym root of AF or AFM stands for? It collates as the top letter of the alphabet. And the answer is AOS family is what its primary name is, but it also means a AOS file manager and an AOS fossil manager. And then last, so means cooperating in all seriousness, carefully thought names and naming conventions are critical to any language design. They're one of the biggest challenges. When I was in the JavaScript standards group, this is one of the biggest problems of, of in JavaScript and every language. When in, in the mid in the mid '90s, I was also part of the Small Talk standards. These were just giant issues if you're a language designer, and very difficult if you're dealing with frameworks and so on. So I wanted to emphasize how important names are. All right, so I'm going to give you a very, very brief. I don't want to spend too much time on this because I actually want to get to demos. But I wanted to give you at least a sense of some of the scope of the languages and things I've worked on as a primary architect or owner of the language. Um, so I began, with the first language I built was in, in 1978. And I had built all the hardware, too. It was an original internet. Uh, sorry, inner part of ARPANET and the MBS net boards and our primary connections were actually between our locations in Boulder. Um, but I built all the hardware and it was a big switch and a manager and I built a basic implementation on it, but it was a lot of fun. It was what really got me hooked in all this. And it was built in 6512, but then I had to program the compilers on a PDP and so on. And at the time I worked at NIST, which today is, was then called, or then was then called National Bureau of Standards. And I was in the scientific computing division, and I ran much of the uh, typography and, and driver, device drivers, and later came to run and own the Fortran runtime libraries and many parts of the operating system. And we were the largest installation of Perkin Elmer mini computers anywhere. Um, I also ended up owning, like I said, a bunch of stuff for Fortran, Lisp, and PostScript later when I was on the faculty at the University of Maryland. And I left there in the mid to late. 80s um, to go work on a bunch of stuff in C in SQL, uh, Formix engines, automated publishing for Japan, etc. And then from there, I got hooked into Smalltalk. That's where I really got exposed to it. Built the first version in 91, 92. That got released. People at, at Apple just went crazy about it, especially um, in in the um, engineering division within Apple. And they got me actively involved in all kinds of their projects. I, I built part of Apple Script. Um, I worked intimately in QuickTime stuff and embedding the engines and languages into QuickTime. And I was all involved in Collida and Skate, if anybody knows what those are, Intelligent. But those were their automated publishing systems and, and, and authoring tools. And if anybody remembers what a Newton is, or Newton was about. OK, we can go. So I did a lot of work in that space. Then um, by the mid-90s, um, I was deeply embedded in the small script, a small talk space, um, but I already saw the writing on the wall for a lot of reasons I'll share in another slide. And the most important thing is from there I migrated. Small script was my first attempt to try to take small talk and turn it into a language that was relevant. And I, you know, small talk's been an amazing contribution, but it wasn't relevant by the 90s for a lot of reasons I'm going to share. And and so that's why I started creating a language called S Sharp, which was a variant of it. Integrated a lot of other stuff. And that got me uh, basically picked up. Microsoft just had been trying to get me for about five years, and they sucked me in at that point. Um, and I, one of the things I did just before I started to join Microsoft was I, I built a whole dynamic language implementation that integrated into their .NET runtime. But later, once I joined Microsoft, everything in green I actually owned at Microsoft. So I was I started off when I was hired to sort of run a bunch of the chief architect for all of VBA and, and Visual Basic .NET with what they called their $2 billion problem, which was that they had jumped on, on board of of .NET and had no idea how to bring forward $2 billion worth of Visual Basic customers who didn't give a shit. Um, and, and they literally didn't know how to make those two worlds work, and they were losing all that money. And then I was looking at, and shockingly, um, I joined because I saw the, what was going to happen with the web and JavaScript. And at the time I joined, there was a half a person allocated to JavaScript in Microsoft. One half a person, if you can believe that. Um, and it took a lot of focus, which really came. I know Lars Bach, he and I have been friends, we've known, known him since the early 90s. And as V8 started to appear, Microsoft started panicking. They didn't believe it was possible. They were so convinced .NET was much better until they basically got proven wrong. Um, that's how I became the JavaScript architect. I owned a lot of the direction for it. I had my differences of opinion, mostly because I 
didn't like a lot of the design of .NET, and so we had disagreement because it was a big corporate decision. Anybody who knows the politics in Microsoft knows that that was a big deal between Steven Sanofsky and, and his outing and so on. Steven owned all of the web browser and was promoting JavaScript, didn't like .NET, and was against developer division that did. A lot of politics in that, let me tell you, and I was in the middle. Um, I, I got so caught up in the middle, in fact, that I ended up in an internal kind of legal dispute with Microsoft, and I just didn't want to be in that position. And so I stepped out and decided to join um, the mobile division. And I worked on Windows Phone, I worked for Terry Meyerson, and I owned the app platform stuff and all the .NET runtime pieces that went on to that, as well as XNA. And then from there, because I was interested, I, at that point I was already planning to leave Microsoft, but I wanted to have a chance to really work in the server division, understand data centers, and understand how, how, how Microsoft dealt with um, DevOps. And um, Jeffrey Snover had been trying to get me on board for quite a few years, so I decided to join for a while on PowerShell. Um, and then out of frustration, especially if anybody knows what was going on at the end of the Balmer era, I just decided it wasn't worth staying. Um, ironically, had I stayed another year or two, it would have been great, but I didn't. Um, and that takes me to um, a number of side projects that have nothing to do with this, where I built a Snapchat app for, for a fairly large company <coughs> and a few other things. But that takes me into why um, I built all TSL. So I'm going to take you through a very brief flashback. I don't want this to be long. I really yeah. just want you to see something. Hold on a second. I need to Are these uh, you should have at your registration desk, or should they stay here? Oh, they're just wherever they're convenient for someone to sign up for. I just want them in here so they could wave them at people and say, here, sign up. Okay. So can everybody see this little uh, box that popped up? So, so I, what you can't see here, I'm going to point out for you. What you see, this is actually just a picker. And in there, those are image, small talk images. This, this is actually what I'm going to run has not been changed, rebuilt since 1998. So it's a straight up implementation, and it's really the 1997 version of um, my small talk engine that my company was selling. And it was, it was um, so we're going to go ahead and run this. I'm going to ignore that stuff in here. But I want to get a sense of what these environments contained in that time period because there really weren't a lot of tools like this, um, whether you're in a Lisp environment or otherwise. And briefly, if I come in here, just to give you a sense of what these tools, I know you can't see that very well, and unfortunately, I don't have to zoom it too much but I can give you a little bit of a tour. So what I'm doing opening on the left, it has a bookmark system, a full class browsing environment, it has an integrated database, it has an integrated web server. Remember this is 1997, right? Um, it has a whole policy management system. You can access and manage all of the registry. It has GUI building tools for drawing. It's a super rich environment. You can store scripts, it, it, the, the language. Let's see if I have any in here quickly. Maybe I'm looking for a very particular thing to register. Oh, so one of the things that was an experiment was that because I was very deeply involved with multimedia at Apple, um, and Apple was trying to acquire, we actually signed a license to put this engine in every version of the Mac in 1996. Everybody knows the details of that we can talk about offline. But it actually allowed you to do rich programming where you can embed video pictures, anything inside your source code as objects and compile it and run it. And this engine started off to give you a sense of performance and so on. The first version of this engine from 1991 to 1993 was running on 20 megahertz max. It's 20 megahertz, just to give you an idea. So I'm not going to tour too much of this. I'm happy to show it to other people offline, but it still runs and it's a very rich environment. And I had deep involvement. There are thousands of classes in here. There's object-oriented database stuff. Um, this was in heavy use all through parts of Japan. We had very big customers there in that time period. So um, I just wanted to give you a sense, a little sense of that. I'm not going to take any more time with it. Let me make sure I shut it down. Yeah. I'm amazed personally that it still actually runs given everything else that's um, happening. Oh, the other thing I'll tell you is all, every single thing you're seeing drawn on the screen is drawn by the Smalltalk engine. It's doing all its own graphics, all its own windowing. Um, 
got bid blitters, I've done all this, all kinds of UI, and when I see reactive discussions and so on, it's like, been there, done that. Um, so, let's go back here to the slides here for a second. So that was my very brief tour through there. I'm gonna tell you the important part, and I think it's relevant because I have lots of friends in very different language communities, but these are sort of, the, and I'm not trying to promote small talk by any means, I'm more trying to give a retrospective of what happens with languages over time and one of the problems that small talk faced. So, from 1986 to 1996, small talk was an awesome language. It was pretty much the most productive language and tool set around. It, it dwarfed over Lisp very quickly. I mean, Lisp was really strong in the early 80s. It got a bad reputation with the phrase AI. I did a lot of work in Lisp at, at the University of Maryland, um, especially in neural nets and other stuff. Um, it has immense integrated frameworks. I, I, I've never really worked in a system where I was so productive. But it equally was a disaster, absolute disaster, for working with text files, text source, text content. And it had a whole sort of code development practice that didn't play well with any other language development model. It also was a monolithic image. It, was, it worked by decomposition. You threw everything in, it lived there forever, and God forbid you should actually want to get rid of anything and make something small and be able to deploy it which means it's a disaster for anything other than running as a server, and it pretty much wanted to run and control a lot of the world. Um, and so it also ended up having engine scaling issues because of the way that was designed. Finally, the, decompos the decompositional model challenge is so difficult for dealing with versioning and packaging and namespaces that um, I learned a huge number of lessons, and I can only tell you how much small talks contributed. You're familiar with patterns or agile programming or you know, test-driven design or unit testing, they all came from Smalltalk. Um, and it's really because it had such a rich tool set for being able to build all that, and it did a great job. It demonstrated it was possible to have typeless, essentially, languages that could build very complex applications. And in fact, it spawned and drove the evolution of Java because it was, at its height, the dominant thing in Wall Street, the insurance industry, and in many other areas. And it was worth so much money, a typical developer was getting $2,000 a day in the 90s. Um, and you didn't have to be a special developer to get that kind of money. So finally, in, between 2007 and 2017, the world's kind of changed dramatically. And I would describe a few things about it that I think are important characteristics in building any software today. So first is that everything is really connected now. It's almost the original statement that was, you know, Sun tried to make that the network is the computer. That's our real reality today. And in fact, it's a big mess. Uh, people message, they don't make phone calls anymore. That's not what happens. People don't really turn on a TV depending on your age demographic. They're chatting, they're watching it on their phone or some other similar device, and they're doing it on their schedule, not somebody else's. The other thing is that compute is really cheap. As I said, these devices, I can get incredible compute power for almost no money. And I can do it in places where power is you know, limited or poor. That, that's a game changer. And it's led to an interesting set of stuff. First, it's led to a proliferation of devices which are very hard for companies to be able to figure out how to make money on because building software on these devices, being able to manage it and deploy it is a big problem. It's all about the software complexity management problem and the sheer volume of data some of these generate or if they're devices, they're meant to turn on and off, be reliable, and how do you get somebody who doesn't really have any expertise to configure it and set it up right? Lots of issues with this, many of which are not well solved. And finally, the world talks today almost entirely, if you look at most software, using HTTP protocols. There are certainly lots of others around, but if you look at how the trend is and the domination, of, of you can't tell what's happening inside. Um, and most of the time, people who are experts can't figure out what's going on. They have to look essentially at a black box from the outside and try to figure out if it's going to work properly. And last thing to point out, and this is really one of the biggest weaknesses that Smalltalk suffered from, is by the time we get into that internet era of the mid-90s to later, everything is text focused. Everything's got to be processed as text, everything, as code is all managed as source files in text, etc. And if you look at most of the way web apps are built, they're exchanging text and parsing it at an incredible rate. So these lead to a bunch of development challenges, but this is the way modern compute works. And it's a very different picture, and it requires very specific kind of features for languages and tools to support to make the job easy. 
building modern software is actually not so easy. Even though we have tremendous libraries, tools to help us. So back to the present. My biggest message here, especially for Tickle, is text matters more than ever. The more I've looked inside languages, tools, databases, text is how things get moved around, exchanged, converted. It's super important. And I find Tickle has some very interesting and unique characteristics to it from all the languages I've worked on. And I'll tell you the two, my two highlight things that I found most interesting as I started to build the TSL system was one, up level and the whole notion of how contexts are made first class and visible. And the second one was the idea of being able to share variables, which is similar to up-level, right? Being able to take a variable and map it into another context. These things actually change the dynamic of how you can build, build your apps if they're made first class developer things. In Smalltalk and Lisp systems, they were always visible, but they were really meant for system implementation. That whole system you saw earlier, it's debugger, everything else was built in itself, but it wasn't something you expected a typical small talk developer to ever see or play with. It was an advanced thing, and it was used to build the infrastructure. It's different in, in the model that Tickle has brought to me. So I'm going to start with something. Because text and other things are really important, I want to share, and it's, it's also, I'm going to once again sort of plug in and remind, you know, things that I think Richard has done that have turned me on an interesting perspective on how to look at stuff. And especially if you look at what's happening in Node.js and packaging and Linux packaging and how stuff's getting deployed. It's just terribly inefficient. Um, I don't know how many people have worked on things like Cordova or they've worked on Electron apps or any of that kind of stuff or had to deploy and deal with all the package managers. It's messy and it's giant wads of files repeated over and over in places. Um, but the important part I'll, I'll get to here is that one of the things I did in TSL was built a virtual file system. Um, and I call it the FSPath system. Um, whether it's a good name or not, it's not really the important point. And as a side note for anybody who's familiar with <coughs> Fuse and Dokken are, that's an important part of, of that story. But primarily, it's that when you're trying to deal with files and so on, it's important to be able to not be dependent on paths and be able to exact places where things are installed. So enter, one, the ability to do sim links and alias stuff. Number two is the ability on many systems to be able to get to and access streams or be stream aware or X attribute aware. There's lots of operating system things if you're doing DevOps where those things, where, where pieces are hidden there. And if you can't get to them and manage them, you can't do DevOps operations. You can't interrogate what's going on. For example, whether you're on a Mac or you're on Windows, a lot of the security aspects of things you download are actually stored in streams. They're just stored in streams on the binary. Um, the other thing to know is that a lot of the challenges that happen in these package systems have to do with the fact that you get many different versions of stuff. You get a version hell. And as a result of that version hell, you have to deploy many copies of, of things. And I don't know how, how people actually survive building apps at a large scale, given the fragility I constantly encounter in many of these frameworks. You, you just have to lock yourself to certain versions of, of the libraries for your break. And that's just doesn't scale. It really doesn't. Um, and so the last part is I wanted to be able to have in the file path system a mechanism to bring some of these together. So I'm going to jump. I'll just I'll jump to the next slide because I think it talks about this and illustrates a little bit. So in this slide, what we're looking at is things that just live on the disk as files or folders. And for those who are familiar with Windows file systems and maybe some of the things that have happened in Windows 10 um, or otherwise. Um, they have drive letters, right? You don't have those on Linux systems. You don't have those on Mac systems. It's not really the same thing. You can think of it like a disk drive, but it's a different model. It's actually extremely rich on Windows, but that's not exposed to the typical developer. Um, the second thing to know is that if you move to a version file system, now you want to be able to talk about using a repository. I actually use a bunch of things that are related to Fossil. It, it stems from the same stuff. Our, our Smalltalk had um, databases in them, and we use those as file systems. But I like the model of mapping it against um, repositories. And I, I'm a huge fan of SQL, and I have been for you know, since the early 2000s um, when I first saw it. And I dropped it in and put it as a replacement into my small talks to take out our engine. But the thing about files, about repositories, is there's no reason not to use a version file system. It works fantastically. And if you compare what Fossil has done versus Git, you'll see that Fossil is actually a much more clever design for dealing with how to, 
how to do branches and how to name them and tag them. And I use that quite extensively as a pattern. Um, so one of the things is repositories therefore can provide you with a file system. So one of the things that was difficult was to figure out how can I unify, it's often the challenge with these kind of languages, how can I unify paths so I can know the difference between something that's on disk, something that's in a particular repository, in a particular version or a particular branch. Um, also the binary executable itself that it comes with a actual SQLite database burn read only into the binary. That's an old trick we talk, I've done for a long time um, in all the small talks before even I had SQLite was I would put things in the binary um, itself and give my database resources, etc. But I've actually burned a SQLite image directly into the binary so it builds and that's just a read only repository it can be read out. Um, and that basically forms where the core libraries live. So the last thing is that being able to actually access anything over the web and based on version and path and so on. Same way, unified model. So I can go to a particular server, tell it I want a particular version off that, can run the entire website right out of the repository. There's nothing on disk. It lives completely in a single database file, serves it all up, and nobody knows the wiser. And you can pick a particular version, which means you can deploy a website, have every version you've ever checked in, and you can deploy and you can have anybody access any version of that website that's ever existed. Because it will serve, you just say what the version or the branches you want, you can tag it, you can rearrange it. It's a very powerful concept. Um, one of the things we'll talk about is the server. You'll see a bunch in the demos we're about to do, because this is almost the last slide. But I really want to underscore how important being able to deal with disk file layouts are. Now the other thing I use, and this is really a pattern of abstractions, um, I very heavily use what you would think of if you're on the Mac as DMG files, or on Windows as VHDXs, but basically, I take disks and I make them virtual. Why do I do that? Because then I don't have to worry what the OS layout is. Between symlinks and having my own virtual disk, I can guarantee that everything I ever deploy has exactly the same set of paths. I, I don't have to worry about paths that might change on one installation versus another, and that turns out to be super important. It also becomes important when you deal with um, the deeper details of symlinks in that there's two scenarios for symlinks in the case of a repository. One scenario is where I want the repository to actually treat it as um, an object, meaning a, a file. So the symlink should actually be checked in and therefore it should be just replicated. There's another scenario where I want it to not know that that's a symlink and use that as a redirect. Both cases turn out to be important. Um, if you're a user of Windows or anything, the, there's a team that makes a really great browser explorer replacement called Dopus. I know the team well. I've spent a lot of time with them because of this issue um, in making sure they support it. What's the name of that browser? Dopus, D-O-P-U-S. You'll see it demonstrated here as we go through the talk. It's um, a super powerful replacement for the desktop explorer. It does all kinds of great stuff. And it's fully scriptable. All right, so that's the end of the slide. Like I said, that was the last slide. So we're going to go now into looking at some live system. And I'm going to bear with me a second, make sure it all switched over. Good. Bring up a browser. Everything you're seeing is running on um, the AFM system, TSL system. There's nothing else. Uh, I guess I should give you a very quick look at what's actually required to even do any of that. Um, so let me just come into my bin directory where this is set up and zoom this up for you so it's nice and big. So, and that's dope is by the way that I'm using to do that. But can everybody see the symbols and files there, maybe? So, the only thing that's installed on here, if you look, these are all symbols. That's really why I wanted to zoom it to illustrate. There's really only one binary. It's the AFM. It doesn't happen to actually be there because of the way I do builds, but there's really just that one AFM binary. Everything else is just a nickname, symlink to it. And ironically, if you take it and you simulate AFM to become a DLL, it works just fine too. So it's also a multi-purpose DLL with many API surfaces, whether they are a SQLite plugin, a Scintilla plugin, an ActiveX control plugin, a service module plugin, it's the same binary. <coughs> so it's one binary deployed. All right, so the other thing you'll notice here is I have things called AFXs. Those are actually executable repositories. So you can double click on them, run them, and they're full apps that run completely out of the database and have all their resources and assets located. All right, so we're going to jump now into um, in the set of demos. So 
I have to confess that I had a challenge in trying to decide how to, what I should demonstrate. So I ended up, as part of the demonstration, building a demo tool. Everything you're going to see is built completely in TSL. The whole web server is built in TSL, and everything, um, um, there are no other components that aren't. So first, um, this, this page, let me take you to home. This is running, and this is just, if for those who are familiar, a SQLite database. Um, the one thing is this web server is hosting it, and I want to just give you a little bit of performance points. Um, pages serve, it serves pages in about eight milliseconds. We'll see that. It's super fast for serving up pages. It understands all the caching technologies as well. Um, and it actually is directly serving the, the fossil repos, et cetera, um, and fully managing them. You'll see some funny things with the login. There's a whole ACL system, but I'm going to skip over that because I don't think we'll have time. So first of all, um, this is the Wednesday track, and we're going to jump right into a very simple sort of hello world. So the way these slides are, the way this thing is put together, I'm just trying to see if my monitor can play. Apologize for a second. Okay. Um, can everybody see the text there, or do I need to make it bigger? Uh, bigger is better. All right, yeah, I should have changed the style, but I couldn't really tell from where I was going. So, but the good news is um, we can also look at it in black or white, so let's do it that way. So, there's a full markdown engine, and it's a rich markdown engine. It's a full HTML parser DOM management engine, and it's actually being used to parse up the markdown pages and generate everything. So the first thing, if you can see the top <laughs> line, that's happening here. Can everybody see that top line? Can you read what's up there? where it says script type equals st slash tsl. So a quick note for everybody. I wanted to make sure that the markdown format was server-side HTML, and I wanted to make sure any tool ever that you might want to use to edit would be able to deal with the code and have it be compliant. Now, if you're familiar with that, that means that there's only one kind of tag, one element tag you can use to put code in. It's a script tag. And so we fully support that. Um, what this is doing is building the banner you saw. So everything you saw at the top with the menu bars, et cetera, is being built. It's also pulling in various JavaScript libraries and other things. And then you see a title tag. And then you see a synopsis. And then you see you know, the double hash, for those who are familiar with Markdown. And you see some code piece here. And then you see another script down here, um, which is going to run server side. And it says include TCL demo. Now, it's a rich include engine. We're not going to have time to talk too much about that. But it is a very important piece of the technology. What's going to happen here is that in the first part, it loads the normal page header. In the second part, we've just written regular markdown. It's going to be served off. And we've got some quoted text, which is what you were seeing in brown. I didn't choose the best CSS to show it here. I apologize for that. And then finally here, this is going to get run. Now, when these scripts, these server-side scripts are run, they're run during the markdown processing, which happens in two phases. There's phase one, which goes and processes the HTML, which then leads to a processing phase of the subsequent markdown. And both times you can run code in either of those. But that gives you an extremely powerful system. And what this system is doing is when this runs, it actually reads the page itself. It extracts that text up there in the, in the back tick quotes. And then it's going to run it for us under a controlled environment show. So I'm going to take you back to the page now that you've seen that. Um, note that what we're doing is we're putting out the whole world in a couple different variations. We put it out to the we put it out to the web browser or wherever. We also put it out to the standard error console. We put it out to debugger out if people are familiar with what that might mean. And we can also write directly into the Windows event log or manage the event log in the registry and all kinds of other stuff. Um, but what we really see, if you can see that text in there, is that um, I have to send this down a little bit. Now, <clears throat> is that we're looking basically at the source code. So I'm going to go back to the demo page. The demo page, by the way, is also completely self-built. I should show you um, briefly what the source to that looks like, because you'll see that it has almost nothing. What's my monitor doing? Oh, I see. I got you. So I do a lot of my editing for those who are interested in Notepad++, but I could have chosen a lot of different tools. It happens to be one of a number of scintilla engines. Um, but then I've, I've got a plug-in that I've written for being able to understand the language and so on. 
Um, and all my talks are organized over here on the left. My talk components are organized. So this is all there is to that page you saw on the talk itself. It also has a script that has a common header at the top. And it just adds in some buttons. These are the button links in here. And then it runs a script in there to automatically look on disk for all the markdown files, parses all the markdown files, and generates all the stuff on my talk as we're clicking. So it's all running in real time. So if I was to write a new markdown file or a new demo, it's instantly up on my page. I don't have to do anything. Um, so let me go back here, and let's start running some of those demos. So the first demo that we have was the Hello World. And I already showed the source, so I'm just going to go ahead and run it, and you can see what happens. So when I ran it, oops, I don't know why the browser is not being so happy. Oh, one second. Okay, good. Let's see if I can make that bigger. There we go. That's really cool. So what happened? You see the result part and these buttons that say run demo, show code, show demo? So everybody's sort of familiar with how all of Tickle works, but this was the H put out content on this line. And then it was a guard, a catch guard in there, and it returned what the result code was. And in here was the actual result object. So the entire thing sort of uh, grabbing the text right off the markdown, evaluating, and then displaying it right back to us. And it's built in itself. In the markdown pages, there's nothing in the engine or anything else. All of this was actually done in the markdown to talk to itself. So this was really just a simple hello world. Um, I'm not going to jump into the registry because I think we're short on time. But trust me, it's showing the event logs and everywhere else. All right, so let's go ahead back, go to the next demo. So the next demo is just to show the app namespace. I'm going to show the source in white because I think um, it's a little easier to read what's going on. Um, so this is just a for each loop. And it's going to out output, it's going to take the app object. Now, I, I'm not going to go too much into language syntax. It's a very rich language syntax. Um, the classes, the, not classes, sorry, there's multiple inheritance, mix-ins, um, <coughs> integrated JSON declaration. You'll see some of that as we look at other pieces. But for this, I just wanted to show some of the, the basic capabilities. So we're doing a for each loop. We're outputting out the keys and values. And then we're just using the rest of the template. So when I come here to run this, Oops. When I say run demo, um, if we look, here's all the keys and values that were just dumped out, as well as their types. So it does type of. Right? Very, very basic. But we're just running it. We get it. You can see the result post three if you notice what I did at the end. I got you. Um, I'm now going to go and do a quick one also of is this really tickle as opposed to is it TSL? Um, it is really Tickle. There's, there's Tickle underneath. You can write Tickle constructs, but there's a much richer layer of language over top of that, which I'll give you a brief look at. Um, and I had it automatically run the demo, so you can see the results. There's a big time formatting library. This understands everything about time. So you can parse time, generate time, manipulate time. Um, it's all done with a time format object. That's very important for almost any of these kind of <coughs> projects you might want to do. So let's go on here to a quick demo of what the SQL query looks like. SQL's built in. Um, you can query anything. You can, as you come, when you come to my talk, you'll see how plugins work and callbacks. You can embed um, directly into the database calls or in, extend the SQL language itself with, with the TSL stuff. Um, and I use that extensively for, for a lot of things. All right, so now we've done that. Let's go ahead and take a look at this more interesting piece. This is the first complex piece of code. What this piece of code is going to do We'll come up here to where it starts. It starts by saying, I need to include the socket HTTP library. And it doesn't really need to include the ANSI library because that's by default. <coughs> ANSI allows me to do a bunch of things with being able to do curses, TTY stuff, and colorize output. Um, but what it does do is it has an HTTP client in here. It's got a connect method on it. It's got a run method on it saying, we want to talk to port 443. <coughs> and it's going to be fairly generic, but it's going to try and ping. Now, what it's going to do is it's basically going to open up a socket connection, ping our server, talk to it, um, and get any result back. It's essentially curl. We have a full curl capability, but you haven't written in TSL. And so if I run this, the other part that's interesting is I can grab this code, and I can just run it, if you, just to give you a sense of what we're talking about for it's like, um, to get an idea of what's actually in it. Sorry for that. 
So this is all. Can everybody see what's in that file? Is that clear? Or do I need to make it a little bigger? Is that good? So this page happens to be called ipconfig.ph.tsl. Ph means page handler. So it's just declaring what we call a func. You can think of it as a proc. We can get into more discussion about what the difference between a func and a proc is. Um, but it's got a couple things that are that you'll notice on this. First, it's got a caret before the URL. So in TSL, a caret means automatically look up the stack to find it. You don't have to up, you don't have to do any kind of upvar. You get it for free in the declaration. And you don't have to do up leveling either because you can declare a func or any proc with a caret after it will automatically up level things for you and share context. Um, what this is doing is it's looking for the URL. It's going to bind in the handler for this page. I can move this file anywhere I want. It'll self-register into the web server and install this handler at that URL at whatever the path location is. What it's doing on the first line is just putting out something to console output. Not very interesting, but the second line in brown where it says my exec equals new child process. Anybody know it's going to run, it's basically going to fork a process called ipconfig, grab all the results of that, and then come back to us, and then send the results out. So we're going to quickly run that. Um, and it's going to run that within the main server. So let me quickly take that and run that for you. And so I'm running the non-worker process version of it. And obviously when I click it, it just ran. It forked the process, came back, did it, and done. And that total thing took about 25 milliseconds um, to do that. We can control any app or process in the system that way and capture all of its, uh, and parse all of its output and so on. It's very, very simple. It's all wired. Um, what we're going to do now is slightly different, and you can, the only way you can really see the difference in what I'm about to do, so you're going to have to trust me on this a little bit, is to see what the time is it takes to do it. So when I ran it here, that ran in 30 milliseconds. <coughs> the only thing I've done, and I, I want to make sure it's sort of obvious as I come back here, so I need to, I need to jump backwards here to the demo page for a second to make sure you can see the source, um, is where did I see my worker? There, that's my one. So the worker, if you look at the difference between these two URLs, this one has demo that IP config, this one has worker demos IP config. I've done a trick. I took the root directory and I sim linked the directory named worker to dot. So it's actually the same exact directory but the name happens to be in the path worker. So if you go worker slash whatever, you're really in the same directory, but now it's got the worker prefix. Does that make sense? Right, is it a trick? So why do I do that? Because if we take a look then inside of our, uh, we have to go up a level here, into our, uh, actually I should go. So here's the worker directory. I need to show you some hidden files. There we go. Um, here's a worker page handler. Let's see what's in there and see how it works. It just has that in it. It really doesn't have anything, but as the server is resolving, it will either look in the repository or look on the disk to load page handlers for the various segments. They can be ACL, there's a bunch of other stuff we won't get into. But this is basically saying, I want anything that comes through the worker path that's mapped onto the disk to be run as a worker. So. When I run that same app, remember I've dot aliased it, so when I run that IP config now, it's being forced to be wrapped around something where it has to run as a worker. What that's going to do is instead of running on the main server, it's going to spawn an entire worker process to handle that, isolate it in the sandbox, and also offload any perf issues I might have from the main server. And I didn't have to do anything to change any other code, I simply put it in the directory path that made that happen. So the only way you'll actually see the difference is when I come back here and I run that worker page over here. So the first one you saw, and so you can see this one took about 86 milliseconds to run as a worker, as opposed to 30 in the first one. And the only difference is that was the time to spawn another process and isolate it, et cetera, set it all up, <coughs> another engine would make it all work. We use this very heavily on our servers because anytime we have big database reports or we need to offload stuff, we just throw them into a worker. We don't have to change any code at all. We merely point it to be on a different worker and it just automatically runs identically, um, sharing everything. So 
We can also go and run, this isn't so interesting, but if I go ahead and run, um, this is just system information. There's the, the TSL engine does a lot of introspection and tells you everything that's happening on your machine. So it knows if you're elevated, it knows what permissions you have, all that's available to you. You don't have to do any work if you're trying to build DevOps tools. Um, so I'm gonna kind of wrap up here. Uh, I don't think I have anything else I want to show in this talk. Um, but like I said, there's far more than I could really present. I just want to give you a, a feel of what the web server and other pieces look like. There's much more going on behind the scenes, and a lot of things have evolved in the language. So uh, I'll stop here, and I'm happy to do boss session or anything offline. Um, but I will, I will call this... Uh, for here. I, oh, I, one last thing I should share with you. You probably want to know when you can have access to it. So the short answer is I'm happy to give access to it. Um, the language is not, it's in its one, what I call its pre 1.2 phase. I know exactly how the rest of the design has to work at this point, but it's not completely stabilized, meaning I haven't reverted some things. I'll tell you one of the biggest ones was um, the use of dollar curly brace and dollar square bracket. Um, an ampersand curly brace and ampersand square bracket. They had some tickle conflicts. I wanted to remove them. Um, I removed. I put that in there, but I haven't swept the code base to change it. There, there are a few other things like that that I need to get rid of. Um, otherwise, I'm happy to make it available for people to try. The one thing I don't want to do is let it go out in the wild to be used for projection stuff until I know all the libraries are baked and stable. So that's kind of where that's at. You can see me, and we can talk about getting a copy or other things during this conference.